I come home a lot after midnight. When I walk into the house, I actually creep up, put my bags on the bench, and I try to just quietly go up the stairs because everyone's asleep. And suddenly, the dining room light goes on, my mom-in-law peeks and says, Zara, come. I made some chicken capsicum, have it. I'm like, I wash up, I sit down to eat. And then we recap the whole day. I feel guilty that I've kept her awake. But she sits, she lights up, and we talk about what we did the whole day, how her day went, how she's super excited about the Bangladesh English Language Teachers Conference that's coming up in March, how she's facing challenges, how she's struggling, and how she's meeting them. And I tell her about how wonderful it is to work in the night shift, work in the ITS industry, have young women come in and try out for the night shift assessments. We're getting up there. We're working together. I go up, I sneak into bed. Naveed is fast asleep. I've been with him for 21 years, so I sneak into bed with my kids because they're going to be off to college. My older one will be off to college in a few years. So as I get to bed, I know I'm going to sleep for about five hours, I thank my lucky stars. I thank God, and I say that, you know what? Life's been very kind to me. And I've had the support of each and every person in my family and my friend circle. And that is why I can try to do what I've done over the past 24 years. I was in university in 1997 when suddenly my father had his first heart attack. Overnight, from a full-time student, I switched into becoming a full-time merchandiser and manager at a buying house, which I knew nothing about. University became part-time. I took an extra year to graduate. But you know what? When I graduated, I did with a decent GPA from North-South University. I had the sense of ownership and, and acknowledgement that, you know what, Zara? You took an extra year to graduate, but what you did in the process was you took care of your family, you took care of the 50 people in the buying house, and you were your parents' strength as he recovered back from his heart attack, came back home, and took the university back. I'm sorry, they took the buying house back. Thank you. 1998, I bumped into this gentleman who was an engineer in America, doing really well with a stable job and a stable lifestyle. And I looked at him, I saw him after seven years and my heart skipped a beat. And I'm like, oh my God, he's still very handsome. So I went up to him and I said, are you married? He said, no, I haven't married yet. I said, what, no one's, ever ma no one's married you yet? He said, no. I said, will you marry me? And he was like, okay. And so I arranged uh, my marriage. It was a semi-arranged marriage. And my father was like, what? You're going to move to the US? I said, yes, Baba, with Naveed. I said, yes, that's the only person I let you go and sail the seas with. So I moved, 1998, summer, went to Michigan. I thought, you know what? After the turbulent academic and introduction to business life, I will have a few years where I can rest and live the white picket fences, married to an engineer, nine to five, relax, go to parties on the weekends, live a very relaxed life in the US. I'm happy to do my own thing, but it was just, you know, tona tuni. We were doing it with each other, just living our life as a new couple. Didn't realize I actually married a madman madder than my father. <laughs> a few months down the line, he's like, what do you want to do? I said, what do I want to do? He said, you have to do something. What do you want to do? I said, okay, you, what do you want me to do? He said, no, no, what do you want to do? No garments industry in Michigan, what do you want to do? I said, fine, you tell me. So sure enough, it was the dot-com boom, and I went into programming. I was sitting in programming one day. I got trainings, and I realized it was not red lipstick enough for me. I didn't want to sit behind a screen all day and do programming. It didn't have color, it wasn't red nail polish. Flashback, 
I was a young child who didn't even know I was a girl. I was scaling trees, climbing walls, naughty as hell. And one day my mother stopped and said, you're 16, you have to realize you're a female at some point. She and her sister and my aunt kidnapped me, put me into modeling school, they put books on my head and made me model. And they made me also um, use fork and knife with books under my arms so that I could be poised, I could walk like a woman. And then I ended up modeling in t four TV commercials. It wasn't easy. What was interesting was, it was fun, I loved the attention. It was great transitioning from being a footballer, a goalie, and a wicketkeeper into uh, modeling. But what wasn't fun was the stigma that was attached to models. In 1991, good family girls did not model. They didn't do such things. But you know what? My family and my parents and my close friends stood behind me like the Himalayas. They said, Zara, if this is what you're going to do, you are going to do it. So I say, 28 years and 10 kilos ago, I was a model. <laughs> Today, I work in one of the largest ITS companies in the world, uh, in Bangladesh. Sorry, not the world. Hopefully the world someday. But we are bringing women to come and work in the night shift. This is a major change. This is a change. There are companies that are doing that. And for us, what it has been has been an uphill battle the stigmas associated with working. As speakers before me talked about freelancing, people still don't know what the ITS industry is about. When people come in, we invite parents to come in and see our company. I say, you know what? This is the garment industry of the 80s. That is what the ITS industry of the millennium is today. This is what is going to be our golden ticket to becoming a superpower. So I encourage people to come join us. But what we need for that is support. We need families, we need friends, we need people to support each other so that not just women, men, women, everyone can just move forward and take control of their lives. When Navid Mahbub shared that he quit his job to become a full-time stand-up comedian, he actually quit to support me so that I could actually fly out to class while he took care of our child um, for two and a half years while I did my MBA. So without support, no change is possible. I can have all the fire in my heart and my belly, but if I don't have my support system and my success circle to support me through it and celebrate my victories with, I will not be able to make any change. So once again, when we moved back to Bangladesh, when I graduated, actually, I'll, fly, I'll go back a little bit more. When I graduated, after 237 flights back and forth from San Diego to Oakland, I graduated with my three-year-old daughter. She was holding my hand while we walked the aisle. I dedicated my entire graduation, my master's, to my child and my husband, because without them, I would not be able to submit a single word of my thesis paper. My father suffered his second heart attack, unfortunately, shortly after my master's. And that shook us. We wanted to come back. That's when we came back. We came back to 2008, December, and I joined a local bank. Navid joined a local university, and he started Navid's comedy club. A man that supported me this far, it is only fair that I support him in his quest. So he has brought, as Sir Abed says, depression alleviation to Bangladesh through his comedy. So I find it, I find it absolutely necessary as his partner to share in his quest and take it forward. So I will work midnights, I will work till five in the morning so that he can make everyone laugh. At the same time, me working till five in the morning means I miss out on putting my children to sleep. I'm blessed. I have my mother-in-law, I have my husband. I have my aunt-in-law who sometimes volunteers. Of course, I have my mom, my, mom, my sister, my sister-in-law, my brother, everybody helps. So 
The thing is, I hear from people, young people today, nobody wants to help. No, you have to sell it to them. You have to go red. You have to tell them. You have to sell your passion to them. If you don't tell them that this is what I want to do, this is what I believe in, nobody else will support you. You need to tell them what will happen when you achieve your dreams, how they will learn to believe in your dream with you. When I was in class seven, my brother was a little child. He was singing, Momo chitte, niti nitte. And I looked at my sister and I said, you know, one day this boy is going to sing. Today, he is the lead vocalist of Nemesis. A lot of you know that. He graduated from IUV, but we believed in his aspiration to become a rock star. And he's done us proud. He continues to do us proud. The most important thing I believe is if you let people fly, you yourself will fly. If you believe in people, people will learn to believe in you. If you give hope to people, you will be full of hope. And if you continue to work and strengthen people, you will just come out stronger and as a believer. You will achieve success only if you allow people to be successful. Thank you.